Welcome to the Spinner Rack with your hosts, Brian and Junior. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the first issue of the Spinner Rack, presented to you by Comics Remixed. I'm Junior Ruiz, along with Big B, Brian Adams. Say hi. So This new podcast is basically going to focus on all types of comic-related talk that you guys talk about on message boards, blogs, in the comic shop with your, uh, with your comic guys and your buddies, in bed with your girl when you probably shouldn't be, you know. If it's comics related, we're talking about it at some point. So keep your uh, keep your hats on, both big and little, and uh, enjoy the ride. So this episode, we'll be talking about two certain companies that have decided to relaunch their stuff with quote-unquote clever names. Marvel Now and DC's New 52. At what point, though, Brian, does New 52 stop being so new? It's five, nine, five years? It's, nine, yeah, <laughs> it's 19 issues deep, and um, it's still being called New 52. You know, it's just like, is it to the point where it's like you could just say it now out of habit and you don't even really care what it's called? It's, it's, a, it's an easy way to refer to it. It is an easy way to refer to it. it I'm sure it'll stick That's until cool. they, you know, reboot in 10 years from now. Right. It'll be the New 52 until, you know, 2022, and then it'll be... They Who won't knows? reboot until 2052. <laughs> yeah, yeah the way 2052. That's exactly what the it is. The new new 52. So we're getting into DC <clears throat> first, and Brian, I want to go ahead and ask you, man. Right off the top of your dome, bullet points. What's the hottest thing about New 52 in your opinion? Like, what are you digging out of it? The hottest thing about New 52 would be the Dark Line. Okay. Um, with the exception of I, Vampire, I've been very impressed by the Dark Line. I've never read uh, an Animal Man book. Uh, Animal Man, to me, has been a decently strong title. Uh, might not be one of their top sellers. I have enjoyed it. A lot of hype surrounding the first issue. I hopped on, haven't hopped off since. Outside of the Dark Line, I think one of the greatest things that they've accomplished with the New 52 is uh, giving new characters a chance, establishing series that couldn't have happened without the New 52, okay. such as an Animal Man or, or a Swamp Thing or, or Demon Knights. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe these could have existed before the New 52. Right. But I think they, they took a lot of chances on things. I don't think Demon Knights because I like the way Demon Knights ties into Stormwatch. Are you reading Stormwatch? I'm not reading Stormwatch. Stormwatch is what Demon Knights become. Yeah, I've read that somewhere in a message board, but yeah. still... It, they actually... They, it makes sense if you read both titles. I was you never know. a fan of the... Uh, it's the Authority, right? Yeah. See? Yeah. This, one of my major issues with the New 52 is the incorporation of Wildstorm which I never really thought was strong property to begin with. I don't think they should have included Vertigo. But we're not talking about negatives, we're talking about positives. That's true. So you're on, li- you're on board with the Dark Line. <clears throat> on board with the Dark Line, it's been good. Um, Batman's Scott Snyder, that, guy's just, that guy could do no wrong. Um, I'm excited to see his new Superman book. Uh, Swamp Thing, another solid title. It seems that uh, there's some titles. I thought Captain Adam was a solid title. I was sad to see it go. I thought Frankenstein was a solid title. Sad to see it go. OMAC, I can't believe I'll say this, but the artwork in that book was very Kirby-esque. The storytelling, I don't think Dan DiDio is a great writer. I actually don't think Dan DiDio is great at many things, but like you said, this isn't the negative, this is the positive, I'll get to that later. That was a really strong book. They took a character that was pretty much, you know, used up 70s, Buddy Blank, whoever, who would want to read the one-man Army Corps, that's overdone, but they revitalized the character in a new way and, you know, took it forward, and I think that is the idea of the New 52. Well, yeah, you kind of don't want to look back. So they say. See, now, my positives with the 52, I mean, I've always I've always been that type of person where if I collect one thing, I've got to collect this, and then collect that, and then read this, and read that. And basically, I buy almost everything. Well, I used to kind of cut back, but I read almost everything. It doesn't matter what it is, you know? Even with crappy writers, I still stay on the book only because I'm not that type of collector who needs to have that gap in their collection. You know, I didn't buy issue 1630 because so-and-so was writing it. Nah, you know, it's not, I don't buy the books for the artists, I don't buy the books for the writers, I buy the books for the characters, because right. I care about what happens to that character's story, and I'm curious to see how it progresses. Even if a crappy character is written crappy, it doesn't matter. Down the line, when you look back and they do like the, the, the uh, montage of everything that character's been through, it fits and it makes sense, you know, so. But, yeah, uh, as far as new good stuff from, uh, or I'm sorry, good stuff from the new 52 is what I meant to say. <laughs> Um, there's a couple titles that really, really stood out to me, man. I mean, Aquaman, who the hell would have thought Aquaman would be the hottest oh seller that it's been in years? You know, Co- Jeff Johns. Agree. Jeff Johns right now, I mean, I can't even say right now, I mean, because he's had it a while back, but he's like, I don't want to jinx it, but he's doing no wrong on anything he touches. 
You know? I'd absolutely have to agree with that. Aquaman, I, I can't believe that I glazed over Aquaman so easily. You and everybody else. That is strongly one of the best titles being produced by DC on their new 52 at this moment. It's it's a great book. Um, I've been on it since the beginning. I've never been a huge Aquaman fan. I was, you know, that you first, everybody else. Yeah, that first <laughs> issue when he did all those blatant Aquaman jokes. Yeah. That you would do with your friends standing around the comic mm-hmm. book store. I thought that was so funny, and you know, he just... Jeff John's is a great writer, man. And I can't even sit there and tell you how many times people still come into the store saying, oh, I just heard about the new 52. What do you recommend? And I say Aquaman. And I get the dumbest look in the world. Like, wait, I just asked you what you recommended and you're telling me Aquaman? Yeah, I'm telling you Aquaman. As far as that Justice League line of books go, you know, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, I'd Green have Lantern. to say Superman is probably the weakest. Uh, definitely. He's definitely the weakest. And a- Aquaman's in the top. Yeah. That's an amazing thing to say. He's at the top. I don't know if I would put him at the top, but he's up there. No, he's up there. I, yeah. I didn't say he was at the top, well, okay. but he's in the top. And another positive thing about the New 52 line, uh, book-wise, I mean, like you said, there were, they gave characters a chance to shine that normally wouldn't have shown, shown shined, whatever, in uh, previous continuity, if that's what you want to look at it. And some of the books that I found, like Deathstroke, was good. Rob Liefeld screwed it up. And because of that, fans dropped it, obviously, you know. But it's like, okay, he's not on the book anymore. But fans just like, well, he already screwed it up. So, Liefeld's not on the book anymore. I don't care. I still don't want to read it. And now they're canceling you, it. You brought up Liefeld. Are we, are we jumping to the bed already? No, not yet. I'm, I'm trying not to. It's just like, you know, like we say on Comics Remix, you know, he's on every... He pops up on every episode for some reason. And it's kind of hard not to. I mean, the guy's had his hands in everything. Um... But yeah, there's a lot of positives about the new 52. I mean, the best positive about it, hands down, would be the fact that it's a new relaunch and it's bringing in a lot of new readers. You know, not only that, it's bringing in a lot of lapsed readers. Yeah, which is probably, in my opinion, almost more important. I think a lot of the new readers that they count on, they're getting in like in trade. Okay. Uh, you're getting oh, people, yeah. you know, that at their local bookstore, and they want to pick up, you know, the new Blue Beetle trade or. Or Wonder Woman, which, oh, there's another title, man, that has... Blown me away. Just seriously, that's the best Wonder Woman I've ever read. Mm-hmm. Ever read. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't a supporter of the New 52 before the launch. And it's funny because Brian Azzarello is not getting the credit he should for that, and neither is Cliff Chang. Yeah, no, oh my, Chang's artwork's amazing on that book. There's certain artists who, when drawing a character, fit perfectly. Like, a good example, in my opinion, is John Romita Jr., his Punisher. Like, his Punisher is the Punisher, you know? That's my Punisher, at least. I mean, talk to people from an earlier era than me. I mean, you're, you got a couple years on me. Um, but, like, uh, Ross Andrew is the artist, if I'm correct, who introduced Punisher back in Amazing 129. Mm-hmm. And to him, to other people, like, that's the right. Punisher artist. To me, it's John Romita Jr. I can't stand this Captain America. <laughs> you know? His Captain America does look a little funky. But um, getting to my point is with Cliff Chang, I never thought I would say that I could look at his art and be like, yeah, he's one of the best Wonder Woman artists I've seen, you know? Hands down. Hands down one of the best. And I mean, Ezra just killing the writing. There's been some book. memorable Wonder Woman artists, you know, uh, Terry Dodson with his wife Rachel doing inks. Uh, you can't mention Wonder Woman without mentioning George Perez. Oh, no. Insult. Yeah. George Perez, like the godfather of the DC Universe. I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to write the Wonder Woman, and you're going to like it. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a bad impression. But no, those are surprisingly two of the top top books, in my opinion, Aquaman Wonder Woman, that weren't pre-New 52. Mm-hmm. Pre-New 52, Aquaman didn't have a book. I don't even think it yeah. was even alive. Well, he was in Brightest Day. Oh, wait, yeah, he was in Brightest Day. They were trying to bring him back, but obviously it didn't really pan out. Right. <clears throat> and Wonder Woman was just a hot mess. It seemed like every writer that picked her up didn't want to acknowledge what had come before. They're trying to do their own thing, mm-hmm. and it just it wasn't. It was horrible. Yeah. And yeah. for people to say that, oh, this is stupid. The idea of you know putting her in with the, the Greek the Greek pantheon and making her father's man greatest thing to ever happen to that character. Mm-hmm. Greatest thing. It's just a, it's a great book. I, I, I've every single issue has been solid. The artwork's been solid. And I would hope if DC went back to what everything was before the New 52, that they would keep her going the way mm-hmm. she was. That they would keep Aquaman going the way he was. And figure out a way to incorporate those stories back into whatever. But I mean, but not like that's not like we're looking at that, though. Right. Well, you don't know. DC has been doing a great job of keeping it under wraps in terms of what are they going to do with Pandora because she was there when the universe is merged. You know. There's another good book. Phantom Stranger, man. Yes, I've Dan DiDio's right. Right again, 
Dan DiDio does read something right. I will admit, I did not read Omega. It was really good, man. I, I just didn't. I'm no interest in it. I, uh, I picked up the first five issues, and I heard it was getting canceled, and I'm the type of person that's like, oh, it's getting canceled, well, screw this, I'm out. Right. I'm not going to give you my last, you know, $10. No, and, then I, the story. and then I spent that $10 and bought the trade when it came out. Gotcha. And then I finished it that way. But it was good, you know, and just, you know, Justice League uh, International, that's another book I really that liked. That made me mad that, that was canceled. And uh, why would they cancel exactly. that? And everyone's like, oh, it, it wasn't like the old, and it's like, well, this is a new 52, man. Mm-hmm. Get over all your fanboy ideas of what JLI is supposed to be, because this is what it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a great book, man. They were talking about, you know, New 52's whole idea was diversity, right? Mm-hmm. To create diver- Man, that was the most diverse book they had on the shelf. Mm-hmm. Every, you know, you, of course, Booster Gold, I love Booster. Brewster's one of the most underrated guys. I think it sucks that he doesn't have a title now. Batwing. I don't. I've never read that book, so I just think it's like. Oh, I mean, I, I give him credit for, but doesn't Batman have enough books? Oh yeah. You know. Couldn't agree more. And that brings us to the negatives to New Fifty Two. You know. <laughs> the negatives of the, the New Fifty Two. Too 52. much Batman. No. <laughs> <laughs> Some might argue that you can't have enough Batman. You know what, man? I love Batman. Batman's one of my favorite characters. But uh, at some point in time, man, there's just it's like it's like the oversaturation of Wolverine at Marvel. It's just too much. Right. Even though he doesn't have you know five different solo books, he's on every friggin' team book. Mm-hmm. Plus, oh wait, no, he he's does have three. Solos. He's got well w- Wolverine Max, if you count that. Wolverine and the X- and what is it, the X Men? Wolverine and the X Men. Wouldn't you That's call a that a book. solo? No, ah, okay, a it's a, but but it's Wolverine. Yeah, Wolverine Max, Savage <clears throat> Wolverine, and this uh, coming, Wolverine books is coming out. Wolverine. Yep. But anyway, uh, biggest biggest issue with New Fifty Two, we're dumping continuity, but we're not really dumping continuity on mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. And Batman, I think, would be used. Batman and Green Lantern are probably your best examples. Yeah, Batman and Green Lantern are the top examples. Um, you know, actually, now that I think about it, I think those are the only two. Those examples. are the only two examples. Yeah, everything else. Oh, though we're dumping there. continuity, but we're not on right. Batman and Green Lantern. Um, you know, but it would have done a disservice to Green Lantern to dump continuity. Jeff Johns has brilliantly just orchestrated the best Green Lantern stories ongoing for five or six years now. I mean, right. What has it been, seven? Am I wrong? It's, it's been a long time since Rebirth. Right. In my opinion, Green Lantern has been a solid title since Rebirth, with the exception of the first couple arcs. Right. Uh, once he got past, once it got into the building of the Sinestro Corpse War, mm-hmm. it's been, that, that book's been solid since then. Oh, yeah. You know, my, my big problem, going back to continuity, is the whole... Uh, Okay, yeah, Batman's got four titles that are just Batman-related, you know, like, I mean, yeah, you have Batgirl and Red Hood and all that, but that's Bat-Family. Right. But when I mean Batman, it's like, okay, if you're going to give somebody four titles, wouldn't you want those titles to interconnect? It bugs me that you have what, he's facing the Penguin over in Detective, he's fighting Joker and Batman, Batman and Robin is just, you know, he's random villains here and there with, obviously with Robin, Uh, Batman Dark Knight, he's currently fighting Mad Hatter. And then, the, okay, bull, cool, five titles, Batman Inc., where Grant Morrison has his own little playground. You know? It's like, you've got him doing five different things at once. I don't, I've always hated that when a character has multiple titles for that reason. Um, one negative thing that I find in the, well, actually, a lot more than one. Um, <laughs> I was saying the editorial staff, they don't know what they're doing, in my opinion. You're shuffling around too many of your creators too quick. No, absolutely. You know, you get, um, there's certain writers. Oh, I won't mention that... George Perez. George oh, wait, Perez are you going to say... Artist. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, he's, he, wrote, he's, he was writing Superman. That's right. But I was writing the Superman. I, I did. I did, too. I, th- I thought that's where you're going with George this, Perez they weren't giving no enough time. No, they weren't. And they didn't. They didn't, and I'll tell you why. Grant Morrison. He wanted to Oh, do, because of action? Yeah. Because George wanted to do certain things, from my understanding, he wanted to do certain things with Superman that DC was not letting him because... More, it would conflict with what Morrison was doing in action comics, so that's playing favoritism. And another example, if you don't believe me on that, another example would be the Batman titles. Scott Snyder's Death of the Family. That was shaping up to be such a badass story. Death of the Family and no one dies. Does that make sense to you? You expected somebody to die. I'm not even right. saying the Joker's dead, because we all know he's not. No, it's ser- and, and then for the death that happened a week later. Yeah, and then the death happens a week later in Batman <clears throat> Inc. Or yeah. two, three weeks later, however the time No, it was only a couple weeks. And it's Grant Morrison writing it. You know, it's like, I feel like editorial went up to Snyder and says, all right, you got to redo your script if you're killing somebody off, because we're killing somebody. We're letting Grant kill somebody off in Bat Inc., so we can't have two deaths like that. I think what would have saved it, in my opinion, like, don't get me wrong, Death of the Family is a great story. It's just the ending just... 
didn't I hold for it me. Sucked. It didn't hold. What it I think sucked. they should have did, and I know David agrees with me because we talked about it before, is you should have had when Joker in Batman Seventeen when Joker unveiled what's under the trays and it's all their faces. That should have been legit. Hell yes, that's that's how I felt. Because how badass would it have been? Okay, now you've got these scarred heroes, not only scarred emotionally but scarred physically, that now have to find some way to gain their lives back, get stuff back on track. We all know that they would have eventually gotten their faces right, back because totally. Bruce is like shit in quarters. But you would have <laughs> just been like, hey, you know, I'll pay for your cosmetic surgery or something. But just for the, the shock and awe factor. Yeah, no, you know? absolutely. I was just like, why? You know, and dude, how bad would it have screwed up Batgirl? Think yeah, absolutely. It. Barbara Gordon was already going into this with a whole mind screw up, excuse me, of what Joker's done to her. She spent now because of the new continuity three years in a wheelchair and got better, and now she's she's scared out of her mind. She's got to go up against this guy again. Bam! He cuts her face off. Right, John Travolta, you ain't got nothing on this. <laughs> but I mean, what would have happened? You know, and then they, to to kind of cop out of it. Yeah, like, I, you know, I it felt was that just, was a huge cop. It out. was just you know a, a mental screwing and nothing's wrong. They just had bandaged faces and their faces were numb. I mean, it sounds like something the Joker would do. It's his mo. He wants to screw with you. But at the same time, why didn't you just do it? Well, that's the, that's the thing, man. Is like everyone likes to be like, "Oh, well, the Joker every time he comes back, it's it's a different right. Joker." But the the Joker, specifically Grant Morrison, mm-hmm. <clears throat> really the last time we saw the Joker not counting the getting his face removed mm-hmm. in Detective One of the New Fifty Two was like crazy mm-hmm. black glove. Yeah. He was off the hook nuts, dude. Yeah. He was great. That was some of the best Joker I've run in years. But to, to have that whole face removing scene not be legit did it detracted from it completely, mm-hmm. completely. It's like so you wanted to bring the Joker back. Every every Batman writer, I think anybody who's always tackled Batman says I always wanted to write this book. Always has their Joker story, their idea of the Joker. They need to tell the Joker story, or at least their version right. of you know a badass Joker story. Personally, I don't know if this is really what Snyder wanted, though. I can't speak for Snyder. I don't think so. I personally think he got neutered by editorial. Yeah, that's that's where I would have to go with it. I totally agree. But, you know, like I said, going back to the negatives of New 52, I uh, kind of trailed off track here. <laughs> we did just get in the negatives of the end of death of the family. Pretty much, yeah. Um, I like how DC is giving new titles chances, but I don't like how they're really giving them a chance. It's like, okay, one bad book, let's ax it for something yeah. else. You know, it's just like... A good example would be Deathstroke, like I mentioned earlier. Okay, you had, it was decent, you had somebody on board that fans weren't related with, they cut him off the title, and instead of hyping it up and saying, okay, you know what, we got a new creator on the book starting with this issue, try it again. They're just like, all right, we're going to axe it. You know, like, really? We're going to give it to Rob Liefeld, you know? See what like, why? Didn't they do that with Hawkman, too? No. Wasn't Hawkman like, oh, God, I can't remember the name of the, art, the writer on that book when it started, but it wasn't Liefeld? No, it wasn't. But then he came in and the just name escapes me at the moment. Shit on everything, curing something. No, wasn't it? I gotta disagree with you there. Yeah, I think Hawkman was pretty good. It actually brought a little bit more life to it. To tell you the truth, Liefeld, if I mean, you gotta really know what he's in. His strengths, his strengths are big guys fighting. That's it. There really doesn't have to be a plot to it. Hawkman is a big guy who fights. Yeah, you got a little plot in there, cool. But I mean, he to me, he had nothing against Philip Tan. That's who it was. Because I know he was drawing it as well. But nothing against Tan and uh, whoever his writing partner was, name that escapes me at the moment. Um, it was good, but in my opinion, it just it jumped up a little bit when Lifeo got on it. Yeah. Even after the book, it was still pretty good. You know, it wasn't bad. Hawkman wasn't bad. I get why they're canceling Hawkman, though, because, you know, the whole Justice League of America. Right. You know, so some of it makes sense. One book I know that they're canceling, and it makes sense. I knew, I mean, coming out of the gate, you knew it wasn't going to last, was Team 7. Because it takes place in DC's past, right. showing you how, they how, got how long could that stick around? Really? I didn't think it was going to go this. Way, I just think it was a good idea. Like by issue eight, it's gone. You know, uh, another book like I had no appreciation for was Grifter. It wasn't. That's another one. It wasn't bad. I screwed the, the character up, but the like, book itself wasn't bad. If you threw out everything you knew about the character from past and started with a fresh slate, it wasn't bad. But if you go into it, like, well, this isn't the Grifter I remember. Then yeah, of course. It was yeah. Bad. So like I said, I was never a fan of like the whole wild sort of thing. Not really sure I agree with the whole, you know. Right. Let's merge everything together. Make yeah. one pretty My big problem with the whole merge was bringing Constantine in. I think yeah. they should totally kept him in the Vertigo universe, and that's it. Really? I'm, I enjoy Constantine. I mean, I enjoy him just as dark. I do. I really do. But I don't. Either you have both versions, or you just have the Vertigo. I so can't you, see being in the regular DCU 
and not being in the. So you don't think you'll get a Vertigo type of Constantine when his solo book ends? We'll see. We got to remember Vertigo was their more mature line, so they can get away with a lot more stuff. But so that was our pros and cons for the DC's New Fifty Two. Go ahead and uh, write us, leave us Facebook comments, Twitter comments, whatevs. Let us know whether you agree or disagree. Uh, Moving on. Marvel Now. Marvel Now. Should have stayed Marvel then. (laughs) Well, it kind of is. It's not really what's really changed. It's not not a a relaunch. I like how they didn't scrap the past continuity. It's like, okay, look. We realize everything is pretty much a big shitstorm. What we're going to do is this AVX, the finish line. New starting point, six months later, everybody starts at the same moment. Everybody starts first. Oh, so it's supposed to be six months later? Yeah. That I didn't know. It was said in Indestructible Hulk, number one. They established the timeline. I must have glazed over that. Oh, that's a great comic right there. Indestructible. Dude, it's Mark Wade. Yeah, that's true. Mark Wade does I that. Hate, I hate the fact that Mark Wade does not get the credit he's due. Everybody's like, yeah, Mark Wade's great, one of the greatest writers. Oh, yeah, but you know who else is better? You know, it's just like, dude, yeah. no, recognize Mark Wade. <laughs> For not only being a comic encyclopedia that he is, but his right dude, his Daredevil, amazing, freaking amazing, easily, easily the first Marvel book I read. Yeah, easily. Better than Frank Miller. Yeah, in yeah. my opinion, yeah. You know, I got a big gay boner for Frank Miller. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not really sure why, because that's really funny that you just touched 300. I didn't even think about that <laughs> either. I was just kind of. But uh, you know it. I like Frank Miller, but that guy, I don't know. I think his time might be done. Right. Of course, has he done anything lately? I know I'm getting off subject. Frank here. Miller? Yeah. Probably. I can't think of nothing. I think All-Star Batman and Rob was the last thing he did. Mainstream, yeah. The goddamn Batman. Oh, God. I don't even start on that. But we're not talking about but this. Anyway, we're talking about Marvel. On to Marvel Now. Marvel Now. Um, pro, my pros with it, I've got to say, I love the fact that it's not a complete relaunch. They didn't throw away all that... Uh, uh, excuse me, what's the word I'm looking for? Continuity. Continuity. You know, they're just like, okay, this is six months later, we're starting fresh. But at the same time, it did hurt it. But, you know, I do like it. Um, not a lot's really changed besides Captain America's outfit. Whatever. And Hulk now wears armor and works for S.H.I.E.L.D. Tony has new armor, but I mean, that happens, you know, like I changed my underwear. So That Hulk comment, man, like, brilliant. Brilliant idea, dude. Let's do something that we haven't done. Like, because they have, for the past five years, have beat Hulk into this monster fight, monster fight. Mm-hmm. And it just gets lame and boring, you know. I mean, yep. you had World War Hulk, or I'm sorry, Planet Hulk, then World War Hulk, then, you know, Scar Son of Hulk, then World War Hulk. And it's just like, this is the same, like, story mm-hmm. in a different box over and over. It gets mm-hmm. kind of tiring. But now you're taking a whole different thing, man. And you're like, just, I love it. It's yeah. a great book. It is. They're doing what they should have been doing in the first place. You know, I think what Mark Wade is doing with the book, he translated his thoughts into Bruce Banner's character when Bruce Banner approached Maria Hill. He said, look, I'm tired of the same routine. I want something new. You know, I want to work for you guys. I want to get the credit that Stark gets, that Reed gets, you know, all these guys. He's like, why not? Why can't I get it? You know, and I think him saying that is what Mark Wade was thinking. So like, why like can't Bruce Banner? Mark say it? Wade's like <laughs> it almost sounds like Mark Wade's going to turn into the what Hulk. you said earlier about he he doesn't get the credit. Yeah, it's almost like he's projecting. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Like he's projecting his feelings and his thoughts in a way through Bruce Banner. Right on. You know, and it's, I call me what you want, call me wrong, I don't care. But I, I see it that way. You know, it's just like, and that's my opinion though. For all I know, he might do. He might get the credit. Right it's or wrong, just that I don't see it. Awesome, awesome book. Very. Awesome book. Very awesome. You know, one of the most solids there. Uh, much like all new X Men. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah. God, I, I had book. my reserves on that so bad when the first issue came out. I was like, "Good lord, this is gonna suck." Bendis has already mucked up the Avengers universe so bad. You know, he's been on it too long. I can get when okay, Bendis going to Avengers when he first did Avengers, it was fine. He was writing an Avengers book, but then he wrote Avengers and Avengers and Avengers and Avengers and Avengers. He wrote like seven, eight Avengers books. Right. And for how long? Almost ten years. Like, dude, that's way long time. When was Civil War? Oh five, oh six. Okay, that's when I bailed on Marvel. Okay, he was writing the way before that. Uh, God, he jumped on Avengers with New Avengers and all that stuff. Yeah, you know. So it's just like this is this is too much. No, pull before that. 
He got off Avengers when Jeff Johns got off Avengers. You forgot Jeff Johns wrote Avengers. Or did you not know that? I actually didn't know that. Didn't Bendis do Avengers Disassemble? Yeah. And then didn't... So, yeah, even farther. Didn't Bendis bring Avengers back with new Avengers? Yeah. That's going to be like a, a, a heading into a new No, story. I want to like didn't say... Bendis, didn't Bendis... <clears throat> yeah, didn't Bendis do this? Didn't Bendis... It's like Simpsons did it. Doesn't didn't Bendis... Didn't open Bendis do this? Um... I like. I just don't want the same thing that happened with Avengers. How it got stale with him writing it to happen to the X Men. Well, that's that's the thing is they need to just like there's there's a story to tell here. And once that story is told, move on. Right. So I don't see all new X Men being a book that'll last. Right. But it can be. It could be one of the greats while it's here. No, totally. As long as they don't you know write like a dead horse, man. But see, like I was saying, when new, all new X Men first launched, I was like, God, this is gonna suck. He go Beast goes back in time, pulls the old of the original five X Men to the current. Why? Why can't they just go back? You know, and they've stated why. And it's just like I compare it. I compare the way I felt about it to how I currently feel about Superior Spider Man. Concept pissed me off, pissed a lot of people off, but I find myself drawn to it every month to see what they're gonna do. You know, the fan reaction and the backlash to Superior Spider Man, Amazing Spider Man. We'll get to that in a whole other episode. But oh yeah, baby! What, what the, how they pulled it off and stuff? It's just like it makes you mad as a fan. But if you're a true Spider-Man fan, you don't you don't care who's writing it, you don't care who's drawing it. You're still gonna read because of the character, which is what I do. And you want to know, okay? Peter's been in some tough spots before. You know, how is he getting out of this? How are they doing it? You know, at the end of the day, if it's pretty, some if it's something pretty stupid, he didn't die. It was a clone. Then you can yeah, be mad at the totally. writer. You know, I, I hate that out. man. I hate cheap cop outs. Suck. That's just that's how it is, dude. I mean, you know, that's like uh, not not to get off. I, I'm going to switch, go back over to DC real quick. Just a small interjection. Infinite Crisis, that whole Superboy Prime beating on the walls of reality and changing mm-hmm. things, dude, that's brilliant. Right. In my opinion, that was brilliant. Right. It wasn't some stupid fuck. It wasn't a dumb cop out. Right. Brilliant. Jeff Johns though, so I guess yeah. that says everything. But uh, I like Superior. It's a good book. I enjoy it. Like you said, though. That's a conversation for another time, really. It will be its own episode, because it deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, another book coming out of Marvel now that surprised me, and even though I've only read one issue, so I really don't know if it's going to be continuously great as Nova. I was really impressed with that first issue. You can't Nova. really even say continuously, because it's only been one issue. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. I, I, I don't know if it's... I'm sorry, sir, don't beat me, me, master. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, that's, that's, that was my point, is I know it's only it's only been one issue, and I don't know if it, but I was surprised. Right. You know, it was really... Uh... I think, look, I have a personal history with Jeff Lowe, whether Jeff Lowe knows this or not. <laughs> uh, a couple of years back, for those that don't know the story, I'll make it real quick. Me and David saw him at Wizard World. Uh, he was totally kissing Michael Turner's ass, making he rest in peace. And uh, kind of blew us to the side. So after the Wizard Fan Awards, he was just chilling, hanging out. David had a stack of Jeff Lowe books. He's like, hey, do you mind signing some stuff for me? Jeff Lowe, look, he was like, he was like, kid, seriously, you're bothering me with this? You know, um, so he's signing David's books, and then after he signed it, you just literally chuck it behind him, and David had to walk behind him and pick it up. What a jerk! You know, um, since then I've heard nothing but nice things about Jeff Jeff Lowe, but that's just like my personal experience right. with him. I will maybe I'll <laughs> cut the guy some slack because that was right around the time his son died, so he might have been going through some shit. But it's like, okay, if you're gonna be like that, why even show up to the convention? Yeah, totally. There's you know there's no I mean? reason to do that. So especially not to a fan, right? So that's my personal experience with them. And I kind of thought about that when I was reading Nova. Because if you really think about it, Nova right now, that whole first issue is the relationship between the boy and his father. You know, the father being a drunk janitor, a no, a nobody, basically. And the son kind of realizing, my dad's a loser, my dad's a nobody, why can't I have more? You know, why? why I, just, I just don't get it. So I think, and if you realize the kid's name is Sam, which was Jeff Loeb's son. And then uh, the first issue, when they first mention his name, Sam is in bold. So I, I think I can check that out. I, I think it's something Lowe kind of threw in there, you know, as a dedication kind of. I think I look at it as when he writes this. May, I, I he's got to obviously have his son in mind as he's writing a father son story, regardless of how the father son story in the comic is played out. You know, so I think when a, when a writer really puts some personal stuff into there, it really shines. Nova's a good example. Indestructible Hulk, like we were just saying with Mark Wave, maybe Absolutely. projecting his thoughts through Bruce Banner's character. You know, um, I can't say the same for Daredevil because Mark Wade writes that, so I don't know if he wants to 
be a blind lawyer or a lawyer <laughs> with that turns out to have cancer. You're not sure that he identifies with Matt Murdock? Exactly. Exactly. So, Uncanny X-Men, how do you feel about Uncanny, the relaunch? What the fuck is Uncanny? What are you, English? Uncanny? Thank Sorry. You. Uncanny X-Men. Pass the crumplets, please. Tip, tip, trio. Anyways, um, I wasn't too sure. I hate constant relaunches. You know, it was Marvel's longest running title without being really stopped. It was like 544 issues. Hey, let's stop it and let's relaunch it. That pissed me off. But then they went to 20 issues. Hey, we're going to cancel it. Yeah. They relaunch it. Like, really? That is kind of The same weird. thing happened with Incredible Hulk. Went up to 15, uh, 15 issues. Then they relaunched it for the Marvel Now one. Thank God. You know, I, I prefer the Marvel Now version, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, as far as Uncanny goes, and listeners, spoiler alerts if you haven't already read it. I thought it was a crazy twist. Uh, obviously, now with Cyclops being viewed by some as public enemy number one and then viewed by some as, you know, a hero, a martyr, so to speak, if he's murdered. You know, I was like, okay, put Cyclops in the spotlight. I was never comfortable with Magneto being on the side of the Angels. Magneto is a villain, hands down. I think the... How do I even word this? It's like, okay, Magneto's that villain where he's like, I'm a villain, but I'm not trying to be. I just need it. Like, society makes him a villain? Yeah. It's the perfect example. It's been done before. It's been compared before. Xavier and Magneto, MLK and... uh, Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Thank you. You know, perfect example. So, with Uncanny X-Men, at the end of issue one, when it turns out Magneto is giving S.H.I.E.L.D. all the all the info they need to bring Cyclops and his team down, you're just like, wow. Either Magneto really sees Cyclops as being, you know, he really screwed us over, or he's returning to his villainous ways and the fact of, well, he's going to betray Cyclops. Obviously, he's already betrayed And he's him. just a jag. <laughs> Pretty much. And he's just like, well, he admits why he's doing it. He's like, yeah, he took away my powers. You know, my powers are off and on. So that proves Magneto's always going to be selfish. It's always about himself. Not the whole, I'm doing this for the mutant race to prosper and everything. Now, see, that's something I don't understand. How did he take away? I I must have missed that somewhere before the the relaunch. Well, it it happened in AVX with the Phoenix Force. When they got the Phoenix Force, remember how Scarlet Witch stopped them? And then they got rid of the Phoenix Force. At first they were like, um, she was, what did she say? She didn't say no more mutants. But, uh... God, I forgot. Yeah, but Magneto didn't fart. have any of the Phoenix Force. No, he didn't, but he was part of the team. I forgot exactly what he did. Damn it, this sucks. Readers, if you remember, or excuse me, not readers, listeners and readers, I suppose. If you guys remember how it happened, let us know, because we are having a brain fart right now. <laughs> and we're giving you this podcast. Originally, you know, the way we do comics remixed, we're not going to sit here and be like, hey, let's pause it, let's edit it, go back right. and read it and re-record. So let's we sound it. like we know. Yeah, so we sound like we know what we're talking about. No, nah, man, we're, we're honest fans like you guys are. We make mistakes. So this is where the fan interaction comes in. You guys let So us see, know. That, that would make sense to me if I knew where it came from. Much like the, uh, the whole well, Colossus being the same Juggernaut thing. thing. With, with Emma Frost, I understand. Yeah, Emma Frost, I get. Yeah, the Juggernaut, fans. I get. Yeah. Magic, I get. Right. Submariner, Whatever. I get. Yeah, he's a douche. <laughs> well, duh. I wish he'd lose his powers so Black Panther could whoop his ass for what he did to Wakanda. That... Have you, you been reading New that'd Avengers? be some Black Panther I want to read. Have you re- read New, New Avengers? Avengers? Yeah. yeah, I actually think that's the, just like the strongest the of the Illuminati Avengers. Thing, thing, and he's just like, he's like, you're. I have to hide you here because you're not welcome in this yeah. country. But if you leave this room, I'll take you down. Yeah, totally. I was like, that was pretty good. It was good. That I think that's the best one of the Avengers titles. Mm. I think Avengers. I guess we're going to get into the cons now. What's that? I guess we're going to get into the cons of Marvel now. I guess so. It's looking up to be a, a lengthy episode here, but I guess it's all right. It's the first one. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That, that happens. That's cool. But uh, cons on it, man. I The Avengers books are trying too hard, man. Yeah, they are. Uh, Avengers just sucked. I feel like in a lot of ways it's trying to, especially Secret Avengers, trying too much to be the movies. Yeah. I don't like that. I enjoy the movies for what they are. I don't need that same universe pigeonholed into my comic books. Totally. Um, Avengers. Brain fart. Academy? Avengers Arena now. Avengers Arena. That's it. That book's awesome. Yeah. Pretty good. I've been liking that. I thought the first two issues were all solid. Not enough depth for me, though, since then. You know what it is? Kind of been dragging on. Before, I'll be, I'll be real honest with you, man. Before Avengers Arena... And before Uncanny X Force Volume Two, the name Dennis Hopeless did not ring a bell. 
Now he's writing both of those books, and both if you read both, they both have their own style. It's not like you can tell when like with a good example is Robert Kirkman. He's why he writes Walking Dead, he writes Thief of Thieves, he writes Invincible. Those books all kind of have the same. I don't say the same tone, but the same kind of writing style. Right. Especially Thief of Thieves and it's the same uh, voice. Walking Dead. Yeah, pretty much. It's like you start to get into the issue, it starts to build up, and then by the time you know it, the issue's done, and you're like, man, I gotta wait. Same thing with Thief of Thieves. You know, that's the thing with Dennis Hopeless over in Avengers Arena and Uncanny X Force. It's two very distinct things. You know, in Avengers Arena, you got what's going on in there with the, the powered kids fending for themselves and I you know, kill to survive. Over in Uncanny X Force, first of all, let me say I love Ron Garney's artwork. He, for, when when I was younger and he was in the comics, I was like, oh, cool, Ron Garney, you know, his artwork looks like everybody else's. But now in this day and age, how everybody's trying to be different, Ron Garney is one of those artists that came out of the 90s, in my opinion, that has actually improved his game. And I don't know what it, it's so, his line work is just so damn clean. You know, if you haven't read Uncanny X-Force Volume 2, you need to read it, dude. I like it. It's been good. My cons with Marvel now would be that they're big sellers. They rely on Bendis, and that's pretty much it. You know, Bendis is writing all their big sellers. Is he writing Guardians of the Galaxy 2? Mm-hmm. Yep. Which is also... He's Iron writing, Man is just... Iron Man's not bad. It's better. It's better, but it's the not first bad. arc. Well, yeah. The first... What was it five issues or just kind of like uh, because you gotta remember the new the god killer story arc is supposed to be timed in with the whole Gal- guardians yeah. and all this well you could stuff. totally read that I right could, without exactly. them mentioning it I, I actually said this earlier on a, a thread that after reading issue seven or eight whatever the hell it was just came out mm-hmm. that you could see how they're setting him up mm-hmm. to meet the guardians did you meet LSD. did you read uh, guardians yes 21? I did I just read that today I did it's pretty good I liked it. It was good. I like I, stories like that that take the show, the, the, the progression of the character, not just, bam, yeah, here it is. Not just Age of Ultron all up in your face. Yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> Fucking Bendis. So, yeah, my, my cons with Marvel now would be the fact that Bendis writes most of all their book, big books, with the exception of Jeff Loeb doing Nova mm-hmm. and Mark Wade doing Hulk. Um, I will not put Su- Superior Spider-Man into this category. I will not. And I will not mention Dan Slott in this category. Why? We'll leave that for the, that special episode. Um, but, I mean, that's it. And then you've got you've got your big, big names. You've got maybe one or two right in the middle kind of names. And then you've got all these new guys. You know, I, lo- I, I hate the fact that they're not really pushing the new guys as much. Oh, Bendis is writing Age of Ultron. Go p- and you'll see right. Age of Ultron everywhere. Oh, Jeff Loeb is writing Nova. And you'll see Nova everywhere. But then they don't promote the, the smaller stuff that these newer writers are doing. You're just like, yeah, it's out there. Like, one of the books that actually, I'm very surprised, read She-Hulk. Really? Yes. So that's another book that was like, oh, she, Hulk overkill. Yep. I don't need this shite. It was Jeff Parker that's writing that. And I mean, I kind of was never really happy with the whole Red Hulk thing. Right. But it's just like, that's a book that, it's one of those where if you read it, you, you know, from the get, it's like, you know, this is pretty damn good. Why, aren't, why isn't Marvel pushing this a little bit more? Right. You know, and things like that is what really irritate me. Is Scarlet Spider in now? Oh, God, I love Scarlet Spider. That's a great book, man. But that's a, that's a pro. We're talking about cons. Right. Besides that, I really can't find too many cons. There's not a whole lot of cons in uh, Captain America. But, you know. Yeah. I, I And you know what? I, I really like the Captain America story. So I'm not going to con the writing on that one. But mm-hmm. I will con the shit out of Ramada's artwork. On Captain America, <laughs> yeah. I have to it's just kind of like, ugh. See, my, my big thing, I was talking with the customer earlier today, and my big thing with Marvel is like kind of what I was saying about the Batman titles, how you've got four different, five different Batman books, and he's, how he's doing all these things at once. That's my same problem with uh, Marvel. Even though Marvel, back in the day, they were more, okay, we can loop this all together. How do you have Captain America running around Manhattan right now, getting beat up by the Red Skull and Uncanny Avengers? Right on. But he's doing what he's doing in the other four Avenger books. But yet, he's trapped in another dimension in his book. <laughs> you know, that's what irritates me. Same thing can be said for Wolverine. Same thing can be said yeah. for Spider-Man. You know, I was all for... Like, I hated when they put Wolverine and Spider-Man and the Thing on the Avengers teams. I hated when Bendis did that. I liked when they were their loner. First of all, Wolverine doesn't need to be on the other yeah, teams. Yeah, no. And I don't think Spider-Man... Spider-Man's get, more of a solo dude. I get why they did Spider-Man, though, because they were trying to hind up him up, you know, with the big-time storyline, and which kind of sucked. You know, and the changes to the Spider-Man universe. There's a whole lot about Spider-Man that sucked, my friend. <laughs> Ever since Straczynski, in my opinion, but... Yes. Well, don't, get, a, don't get me wrong. That's I'm another story. I'm not a Spider-Man hater. I, Spider-Man is actually my favorite Marvel hero. Definitely. I mean, it, the shoe fit, fits currently. 
Yeah, I see. That's just somewhere we'll have to disagree and say for the for a future episode. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, what we got going on for Marvel now, pros and cons, as well as New 52 pros and cons. Oh, let, um, me, let me just pitch this in here. My one last final thought on Marvel now. What's up? This is the status quo. But it's not. You can't see me, but I'm just kind of rubbing my head in shame here. <laughs> That's um, my biggest issue with that. Yeah. It's like, is it or isn't it? This is what we're going with now, people. Enjoy it. Two weeks later, it changes. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, you can't. It's either you say it. Like, when Marvel Now was being announced, it's like, okay, is it a reboot or is it a relaunch or whatever? They're like, it's a relaunch, but it's not a relaunch. Like, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, it, it is or it isn't. Go all out. DC <coughs> took the risk and look what happened. You know? yeah, it totally, totally paid off for him. Exactly. I mean, I get Marvel not wanting to throw years of continuity away. Mm-hmm. But they could have did what DC did with the Batman and Green Liner stuff. Absolutely. Shrunk the timeline. DC, Absolutely. According to DC, their timeline, the DC universe proper has only existed for 10 years. Year one is Superman's debut in Action Comics. Year four is Batman's debut. Year five is the formation of the Justice League. And then current. That's it, you know. It's really funny, though, in closing thoughts here on the New 52 and Marvel Now, that I think they both have the same problem, kind of. They both say, this is the status quo, but they both don't uphold that. Right. You know, and uh, it's, I guess it is what it is, right? You know, as fans, it's our job to critique these things. You know, it's our job to sit there and bash them, praise them, whatever have you. They say, uh, well, if you don't buy the books... Then uh, you're speaking with your with your wallet, and they won't publish it. That's BS. Because you're Dude, always that's total BS. I mean, I hate to use him as an example, but Superior Spider-Man. If the whole wallet thing was true, I don't think they'd be selling as many copies as they say they're selling. But whatever, I don't know those numbers. So yeah, I'd love to get into the numbers of everything, but yeah, don't even. That's a whole other ball game, buddy. So that's uh, pretty much wrapping up this first issue of the Spinner Rack. As always, you can get in contact with us via YouTube on Comics Remix. You can look for us on Facebook at facebook.com slash comics remix. Twitter at comics remix. Email us directly at comics remix at gmail. God, where else can you contact us? Where can they contact you? We're going to get hold of you, B. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm going to have to figure that out for next time. Because at this point, I ain't got that. I'm, I'm not giving away my personal email address. You guys need to get in contact with Big B. Just Hit him up at uh, on our Facebook page. Leave a message on Facebook. Comicsremix.com. Or, excuse me. Oh, yeah, duh. That was the other one I was thinking of. How did I forget to plug my own website? Comicsremix.com, people. <laughs> uh Facebook.com slash Comics Remix. Twitter at Comics Remix. I don't use Twitter, so it's like that one kind of throws me off. You know, just hit us up. Let us yeah, know what your thoughts. I don't tweet. I tweet during wrestling. Tweet. So things you could kind of look forward to in upcoming episodes. We, we've got, in no particular order, we got to tackle The Walking Dead. we got to tackle this whole Amazing Spider-Man 700 slash Superior Spider- Spider-Man number one fiasco. We got AVX. Some fa- AVX, definitely. we got some favorite storylines coming up. Uh, we're going to sit back. Talk God, we've got to talk about Thor. Marvel now, Thor. Thor, you know, the God Slayer. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff coming up. There's um, a lot of good stuff. If there's a, if there's something you guys want to hear us talk about specifically, let absolutely, us know. Man, you, just, you pulled that right out of my brain. I mean, it's true. No, absolutely. I would love for people to interact with us and be like, mm-hmm. hey, I want you guys to talk about this. Right, right. Just let us know. Uh, drop us a note. I already explained where you can find us. Thank you guys for listening. There was something else I wanted to say, and for the life of me, I can't remember. Now cue the Jeopardy music. <laughs> no, I was, I was joking. Um, but yeah, like I said, you guys want to hear something, thoughts, complaints, you know, hey, you guys ramble too much, you guys, you know, you guys don't know what you're talking about, I disagree, but whatever the feedback, let us know, because it helps us make a better show. Absolutely. You know, like, you guys are talking, you guys are jumping from subject to subject, you know, you guys are talking about Marvel and all cons, but you guys are talking about Image instead, you know, and it's like, what the hell, what gives, you know, let us know. You know, if you think I should show my ass to the world, let me know. I probably won't do it, but let me know anyway. I'd like to know. And yeah, they do have a YouTube interested. show for that. Yeah. Yes. Comics Remix. Look us up on YouTube. Then then Sanchez can earn that dirty moniker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? I do, being that this is the first issue, I do want to say thank you to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people who supported the idea, not of just the show, because this is not Comics Remix. This is the Spinner Rack. So there's a lot of people who I've told about this podcast, and they're like, yeah, I can't wait to hear it, you know. So uh, if I really run down the list of names, we'll be here for a couple hours. 
So just thank you to you guys who just, who have let me know that you're actually waiting for this. So this is just another project, everything we really can't fit into Comics Remix as, a, as an episode itself, you know? Absolutely. That's all I got to say. I'm done rambling. My mouth is getting dry. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to everybody. Remember, Facebook, Twitter, ComicsRemix.com, and that other one. that is Like hits. the page. Visit the website. Dude, that was... Totally awesome. Just like the hey, voice, man. the expert. Like the page. Visit the website. Absolutely, man. For more information, you know. <laughs> Check out the website. It's great. Check out our boy John's rants. John's Paparellas Point. He's got his blog going up. Of course, he's got his reviews on Facebook. Paparellas Pizzy. <laughs> that just sounds bad, dude. <laughs> it did. I, could, I didn't say pizzle, so I mean, it's not one like... Th- <laughs> one last thing. I know I keep saying last a lot, but one other thing we want to discuss, or I want to throw out there real quick. Brian, John, and myself are avid wrestling fans, so you will hear podcasts from us involving wrestling. That's coming real soon because WrestleMania is right around the corner. Special. So we'll have some one coming. special, some comic remix specials on the wrestling. Sorry, wow. I don't know why I just got all gay with that. Probably because of Fandango. <laughs> well, I heard some stuff about that, but yeah. All right, so for the first issue of The Spinner Rack, I'm Junior. I'm Brian. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. We'll see you in issue two. Later.